I'll set that down, not break things. Yeah, so thanks very much for having me. Thanks for coming. Um, so, uh, right, I'm just down the street uh, at Northeastern. And uh, what I'll be talking about today is work that colleagues and I have been doing for a number of years now on trying to build natural language processing models that can kind of consume and help physicians and other domain experts make sense of the medical evidence, right? So uh, a bit of personal history, because I'm at UMass Amherst and I'm feeling nostalgic. Uh, so here I am uh, <laughs> in 2005, I think, is significant bits. Is, is, I, is this still, does this still, still exist? Uh, so I did some work with Jim Carosa as an undergraduate, and that's and, and Rick Adrian, um, and that's kind of uh, how I ended up here. So, so yeah. So I, I thought I would just I, I don't know be a, be a bit nostalgic for a moment. Uh, right. Anyway, that aside, uh, I should give an additional caveat, which is that um, the work that I'll talk about today will be drawn from a number of different kind of recent pieces um, of research that I've I've done in collaboration with some really great colleagues um, that I show here. I'll try and give shout outs especially to the um, graduate students, the PhD students on the bottom row here who uh, have of course done a lot of the actual heavy lifting on these efforts. So I'll, I'll try to um, give them shout outs when I'm talking about the, the pieces of work that they've respectively led. Okay, so um, by way of motivation, I thought I would start by just introducing this concept, which might be foreign to you, of evidence-based medicine, or EBM, because a lot of my um, technical work is kind of, I guess, in the service of trying to realize this vision. So the British Medical Journal says, uh, EBM is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. Right? This probably doesn't seem terribly radical to you as an idea. Um, but it's actually not super common, um, or, or sort of at least wasn't at a time. The Times actually had a piece a couple of weeks ago, or maybe a month ago, talking about how uh, a lot of the, do the treatments that doctors offer still really aren't actually evidence-based, right? And so evidence-based medicine, or EBM, as a paradigm, is really a data-driven way of practicing medicine and um, developed in response to, to this problem, which is that a lot of times um, treatments that are prescribed maybe aren't, aren't done so on the basis of, of rigorous evidence, right? So EBM is this kind of data-driven way of practicing medicine where what we say is, we say we want to select treatments on the basis of um, evidence. And what is that evidence? Well, at current, the best way, the best sort of technology, I guess, that we have right now for inferring the sort of comparative effectiveness of two treatments, say A versus B, remains the um, randomized control. Uh, trial, right? And so in an RCT, a randomized control trial, what we're going to do is we're going to take some uh, population of interest, we're going to randomize them so that one receives, one half maybe receives treatment A and one half receives treatment B, and in this way we can tease out the causal um, effect of the respective treatments, right? All right, so ideally then what we would do is we would inform patient care on the basis of um, randomized control trial results. Right? Of course, individual trials um, themselves are subject to noise. Right? So here's John Oliver talking about how, I guess, everything, uh, if you kind of follow the health media coverage of, let's say, clinical trials as they come out, you might be under the impression that sort of everything both causes and cures cancer. And I, you know, I think the problem here is that individual trials, are, they tend to be small. Right? The, they only have so many uh, sort of people in them. And if they are designed or executed poorly, they are also subject to biases. So I will talk a little bit about trying to use NLP techniques to suss out these biases. Um, that's sort of some of the stuff we've been working on. Um, but in any case, in response to the noisiness of individual trials, um, in EBM, the preferred technique, the preferred kind of approach, is that of evidence synthesis, right? And this is sometimes called meta-analysis. And the idea here is if you have a clinical question regarding the efficacy of a particular treatment, like what's the best treatment for some condition, what you should do is you should go out and rigorously and comprehensively identify every trial that has addressed that clinical question. And so here, you know, you might have one, two, three, four, five, six trials. And you look at their point estimates, which might be a mean difference or an odds ratio or something like that. And then what you do is you take some sort of average of those point estimates. And that's what's shown on the top. That's that blue diamond. And this gives you a robust treatment um, efficacy estimate, basically. Right? And the idea is that this will be less noisy 
than the individual trials, right? It's more reliable. Okay, so this is the dream. These things, these meta-analyses of clinical trials or systematic reviews are super useful. They're considered the best possible evidence um, that, that you could have. So in an ideal world, I suppose, we would always inform patient care on the basis of rigorous statistical syntheses of all available relevant evidence, right? Um, this might all sound totally reasonable to you, but you might also be like, this is a computer science seminar, so why am I talking to you about this? Uh, I'm a natural language processing person. And the, the reason that I'm talking to you about this is because we have sort of an insane system where the way that we disseminate the results of clinical trials is in unstructured articles that describe the conduct and results of those trials. Right? So this is a, a picture that I took when I was, I spent some time as like an embedded computer scientist at the Brown Center for Evidence Synthesis in Health. So they spend all day, there, there are doctors there, they spend like sort of all day going through piles of literature that look like this kind of making sense of clinical trial results. So this is Tom Tricolinos, he's the director of that center. Um, and a lot of my work is trying to make Tom less miserable um, by automating a lot of the boring stuff so that he can actually sort of do thoughtful evidence synthesis and actually sort of think about how we should be making um, decisions about patient care and not just like wading through terrible PDFs. Okay, so the problem's getting worse. So this is a plot that's showing the number of randomized control trials that are indexed in PubMed, which is a repository of biomedical literature um, year over year. And you can see this kind of very rapid growth and the, the literature base is already quite large. I think something like it's over 100 clinical trials or reports of clinical trials are published every day on average. Um, so consequently, the time it takes to produce a single systematic review or meta-analysis, which only answers one clinical question, takes about 70 weeks uh, on average. This was a, a BMJ study that came out. So that's a really long time. One of the things that that means is that by the time you publish the synthesis of the existing evidence, it's probably already stale. There's probably already new evidence that's been published that's relevant to that question. So there's this article that came out in um, this Nature offshoot that sort of talked about this problem in the context of the Zika virus, which is a fast moving field. Um, and actually they highlighted some of the stuff we've been working on, which we thought was really cool as a potential mechanism for, um, for dealing with this. So um, what have we been doing? Well, one thing that we've been working on is this, this, this idea of robot reviewer. And the idea behind robot reviewer is to take these unstructured articles that describe randomized control trials and extract meaningful things from them and synthesize those things. It's probably easiest if I just show you a very um, simple example. Um, so if I go here, yeah, so this is what it looks like. Um, so the idea is that, um, so this is just like a sample um, analysis that we do, but the idea is that you upload, in this case, four PDFs of articles that describe um, clinical trials, and it will generate for you things like the statistical risks of bias that are inferred. I'll talk about that in a bit. And it will try to summarize key aspects of these, like what, what kind of participants were involved, how many of them were there, um, what were the outcomes measured, and what were the interventions considered. And it will also try to, for example, infer um, what the reported directionality of the finding was. Right? So in this case, for example, the model has inferred that there was a significant increase reported with respect to this, um, this outcome that was extracted um, when you use this um, intervention, which, which in this case is moderate to uh, vigorous physical activity. Right? And so all of this is done um, using sort of our models um, that I'll talk about next. Okay, so that's kind of the general idea. So that, that's my sort of opening spiel, kind of motivating what we've been doing. And what I'll do now is try to talk about a few different um, components of this work in a little bit more detail. So the first of these concerns, as I alluded to, assessing the risks of bias that are inherent to uh, any given clinical trial. And the way that we do this is on the basis of reports of that trial. Right? So um, this is a really key step, as you might imagine, if you're trying to appraise the evidence concerning like what treatments are actually uh, effective. When you're looking at a particular trial, you sort of want to know how reliable that the results of that trial report are. Right? And so this, this idea has been formalized in something called the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool. They call it a tool, but it's really like a checklist or a framework. 
And so Co oh, Cochrane, by the way, Cochrane is this huge collaboration of like 30,000 people. And what they do is they basically produce these um, meta-analyses of the medical literature. Right? And so they've released this, this, this tool, this framework, which says if you're trying to appraise the reliability of a randomized control trial, you should assess things like was there proper random sequence generation? So like did they actually randomize people uh, you know, not using their last names or something? Um, you'd be surprised. <laughs> um, you know, was there allocation concealment in place? Was there blinding of participants and personnel? And was there blindings of outcomes assessment? Right? And for each of these, the idea is that um, people should, you know, sort of physicians should assess the overall risk of bias as, you know, either high or sort of um, low, basically. So low, low being a, a higher quality trial, I guess. And also provide support in the form of a rationale for this judgment, right? So this is important in the name of transparency because these assessments can be a little bit subjective otherwise, right? So it's a little bit like if you're reading a, a paper and they don't report their hyperparameters, you might be like, mm, this is maybe dicey. And so it's a, sort of a similar exercise, but in the space of, of clinical trials, I guess. So this is super time consuming. So doing this for one, one trial report, one article takes about, I think the estimate is like 30 minutes um, for one of these. And these are, you know, these are expensive people. They're highly trained personnel, right? So it doesn't scale very well. So we'd like to automate this. From a machine learning perspective, this, this looks like an instance of learning with rationales. So um, the idea of learning from explicitly marked kind of support has been around for um, over a decade now in natural language processing anyway. Um, and again, the idea is both to exploit at training time and to um, be able to provide at test time kind of rationales, which are snippets from the, the input text that I guess support a particular classification. Right, so um, at the time when we were working on this for uh, risk of bias assessment, a lot of this work on rationales hadn't yet been kind of ported into the modern kind of neural architectures that we've, we've now all come to know and love. And so in, way back in 2016 at EMNLP, my uh, then student, Ya Zhang, who's now at Google Brain, um, introduced this uh, rationale augmented convolutional neural network. So I'll just talk about this very briefly. Um, the model is probably um, what, you, what you might kind of expect. What we do is we segment an input document into sentences. We encode those sentences independently. We used a convolutional neural network, but you could, of course, use an RNN or, I guess, if you're being modern, a transformer. And then what you are going to do is you're going to take each of those sentence vectors and you're going to introduce an intermediate layer. The intermediate classification layer is going to predict whether or not those respective sentences are rationales or not, right? And I guess what's, what's kind of interesting here, or at least a little bit different, is that we have explicit supervision for this, right? We, we have data where we know that certain sentences, let's say, were marked as supporting a risk of bias assessment. And so we can actually supervise this layer, right, explicitly. Um, subsequently, what we can do is induce a document representation which is just a weighted sum over the constituent sentence vectors where the weights are proportional to the predicted probabilities that those sentences are rationales, right? And you know, that gives us a, a document level representation which you can then pass forward through the final classification layer to say, yes, okay, this document is at low risk of bias, let's say, for this domain. Okay, so that's, that's the, the, the model. Um, what I would say is this thing, it does a little bit better than um, prior approaches. So here I'm showing the predictive performance in terms of accuracy. It's a roughly balanced data set, so this is appropriate. And I'm showing that predictive performance for the four core domains I mentioned. These are the things that are defined by that Cochrane tool. So random sequence generation, allocation concealment, blinding of participants, and blinding of allocation um, assessment. So, um, sorry, blinding of outcomes assessment. Um, so what this is showing is that this rationale augmented convolutional neural network, which is like the salmon colored thing, it, it outperforms like a bunch of um, sort of alternative strategies or baselines that I, I won't sort of get into the details of. The one thing I would like to highlight that I think is sort of interesting is that um, if you look at the, the rationale augmented confnet versus the exact same architecture but without 
the explicit supervision at the intermediate level layer, which is the ATCNN model. Um, what that says is that if you, if you don't train that intermediate level layer and you just try to learn it end to end, which you could view as basically imposing attention over sentences, you, um, you suffer uh, quite a bit. Right? So it's not hugely surprising that like, explicitly supervising this intermediate level layer like, works better, it's more supervision. On the other hand, it is kind of nice to, I guess, see that borne out in the data, right? So, so I guess the lesson here is if you have intermediate level signal, you should definitely exploit that. Um, and in, in the context of text classification, this kind of supervision is actually not that difficult to get, right? Because in many cases, if somebody's doing categorization in the first place, they probably can sort of mark the snippet supporting that decision, right? So, um, so I guess that's, that's the idea there. Um, so one of the things, I, uh, so this is the sort of model, and this is what's in Robot Reviewer now, our, our prototype. We, we've tried to like make this widely available so that people actually use it. So the idea is that you can use this to kind of appraise the literature at scale. And so one of the, one of the places that's using our model now is this TRIP database. So um, TRIP is a uh, clinical sort of search engine. It's widely used in the UK, I think less common in the US. Um, but they use uh, robot reviewers' risk of bias predictions to prioritize retrieval of evidence that seems to be high quality. So we think this is, this is kind of cool. Um, I will say since we published our model, a bunch of independent analyses have been done on uh, this risk of bias, this automated, our, ris our automated risk of bias approach. So there was this paper that came out in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, and they're using robot reviewer, that's our thing, and they're appraising sort of how good it is. At, um, at doing this. And they end, up, they end up coming to this conclusion, I don't know if you can read it, but I'll read it for you. So it says, robot reviewers' reliability with human reviewers was similar for most domains and better for allocation concealment, blinding of participants and personnel, and overall risk of bias. Right, so they seem to be ascribing, I don't know, maybe superhuman performance. Uh, so, <laughs> we, we, so there's been a couple of these papers that have come out actually that have, in, groups independent of us have been looking at these risk of bias models. These are people that are interested in the application. And these are fine, like it's interesting work, but a lot of it has framed it as if it's like human versus machine, which is not ever how we intended the model. So we've always intended this to be kind of augmenting um, the domain experts, the doctors. So we did our own um, randomized control trial recently, which was a, which was a, a lot of fun. It took a, it took a while. Um, but basically what we did was we went out and we recruited um, something like 40 participants. These are people that kind of do evidence synthesis for a living. So they're quite familiar with appraising randomized control trials for risk of bias. And um, we had a, a super set of articles that describe randomized control trials. And we sampled, for each individual, we sampled four of these at random. And the idea was that each individual, each participant, would do risk of bias assessment for all four of these. And for two of them, randomly selected, they would be given our, uh, our model's predictions to aid them. And the question was, does this help them? Is it, does it kind of speed the process up? And also, basically, um, do they agree with the model's kind of rationale predictions? Okay, and so the interface was always the same. It was always like this. So this is the PDF, and the only difference in the two cases where they were using the model predictions or they weren't um, is whether or not these four boxes, which correspond to those four domains that, again, I mentioned before, were pre-populated or not, right? So if they were using the machine learning predictions and these come pre-populated, they could overwrite those though, right? They could delete the rationales or they could add rationales and they can overwrite the overall assessment, okay? So uh, to the first question, did it actually uh, reduce workload? The answer is yes, it, by about 25%. So it's not, like a, it's not like a huge reduction in workload, but given that these things are, are pricey to conduct, like we're reasonably happy with, um, with this sort of one quarter uh, workload reduction. And in terms of the rationales, um, what we found was that most of the time the, the users really liked the rationales that were provided. So in other words, um, on the left hand side, what, you, what it's showing is the rationales that were deleted by the user. And what you can see is that the vast majority were not deleted. So most of the time the, um, the domain expert agreed with the rationales provided. And 
on the other hand, the rationales that were added by the user manually, uh, what you can see is that most of the time they didn't bother adding any additional rationales. So I guess this side sort of speaks to the um, precision and this side to the recall, basically. Okay. So we were pretty happy with this finding. We also did like a usability study. I won't get into the details of this, but they liked using the prototype. They felt like the predictions were useful uh, in practice. So this was really satisfying for me just in the sense that, you know, it's one thing to kind of, for, it's sort of one thing to demonstrate your model gets like some F1 score or something on a data set, but it was another thing to actually field it and, and sort of have people use the predictions and tell you that they're useful. So we were happy with this. Okay. So that's all I want to say about um, risk of bias assessment. Um, what I'll talk about next concerns trying to extract kind of key trial attributes, right? Uh, and in particular, um, the, the sort of the underlying kind of attributes of a clinical trial, you can think of as being these PICO elements. So PICO stands for uh, population or participants, interventions, comparator, and outcome, right? And the idea is that a well-specified clinical question will implicitly specify a PICO frame. So in this example, women with hypertension would be the population, regular exercise would be the intervention, um, no regular exercise would be the comparator, and the outcome would be hypertension, right, as an example. So um, when we started on this, we didn't, a, a sort of common theme in this space is a lack of supervision, right? Like it's hard to get your hands on supervision. So when we started on this project, or on this problem, um, we said, well, we'd like to train a model that can recognize these PICO elements in, in articles that describe trials. Um, and to do this, we took the Cochrane database. So Cochrane is that organization I mentioned before. And they have this database of reviews, analyses that they've conducted previously. And what we can do is we can look at the um, free text descriptions that have been written by Cochrane review authors for previously conducted reviews, and we can match those up with full text articles describing the, the corresponding clinical trial. And we can use that to induce distant supervision, because these are not, these are abstractive summaries that were written by the Cochrane people. They're not like copy and pasted, they're not extractive. So we can't do exact matching, but we can do naive string matching tricks to induce, let's say, distant supervision over sentences in full text articles, right? So basically you just like look for word overlaps. Um, and this worked okay. Um, we use this kind of distance supervision approach for a couple of different um, pieces of work. In the, in the first, we tried to improve it a bit using a little bit of direct supervision to try to improve the mapping from the Cochrane database to the sentence labels that we were deriving from it. We called the supervised distance supervision. Um, and that, that, worked, that worked pretty well. We were able to build some models on the basis of that supervision. Um, and we also uh, used this kind of distant supervision approach to try to learn disentangled representations of biomedical abstracts, where instead of just having like one vector that represented uh, a paper, an abstract, we represented an abstract with um, vectors that corresponded to the respective PICO elements. So I'm not gonna, I won't talk about the, these, these pieces of work in general, but I just wanted to highlight that you're able to use this kind of distantly derived supervision um, to sort of do some useful, useful tasks. And the, the latter work was led by uh, Sartak, who's shown here as a PhD student at Northeastern. Okay, but we got tired of working with the distant supervision. So what we did was we finally just decided we would collect our own data set. So we've now released this. This was led by Ben Nye, who's a PhD student shown here. Um, and so we have this ACL paper from last year in which we introduce a new data set that we call EBM NLP. And this comprises 5,000-ish um, abstracts that are from randomized control trial reports. And these are manually annotated um, with PICO elements and more granular PICO information as well. So. Um, the first phase of just kind of labeling the snippets that correspond to the PICO elements looks like this. So this is kind of like the picture I showed before. Um, basically, you know, here, for example, this is maybe a part of an abstract. The green nursing home patients with dementia would be the participants. Um, the things like quality of life and neuropsychiatric symptoms would be the outcomes. And the interventions are things like um, some sort of educational intervention in this case. Okay. 
So um, this is what the sort of simplest form of the data looks like. You can grab it at um, pico-extraction.ebm-nlp.com. Um, We've been we've been excited to see you know some uptake of this. So if you if you take like the biomedical spacey now, they'll they have like a, a pre-trained Pico model that's on this that was trained on this data. Um, so uh, we've been we've been excited about this. Um, now, how did we get this data? I think is is maybe a natural question. I mentioned before that it's it's hard to come by supervision in this space. So what we did was we actually we actually crowdsourced the training data set of this the the training component of um, this data set was collected from just randos on the internet, right? So, <laughs> so we, we threw up some tasks on Mechanical Turk, and it's not obvious that they'd be able to do this, right? Because um, it's slightly technical, it's jargony, right? Like this is biomedical tech, so you're like asking people to annotate, you know, medical interventions and stuff. Um, but what we found is that if you're clever about how you aggregate the annotations that you receive, you can get reasonably accurate span annotations. So the test set, I should say, was annotated by uh, people that have either MDs or were in sort of training to receive an MD, medical students. So the test set is maybe a little cleaner. Um, I'll mention in passing that uh, one of the tricks that we used here was when we aggregated the span annotations that we collected from independent crowd workers, we used a model um, that we proposed at ACL a couple of years ago um, that extends David Skeen, which is a standard approach to pooling unstructured categorical responses um, from multiple independent workers. We extended that um, by sort of incorporating a sort of Markov structure underneath it, right? Because here we're doing sequence tagging. So you want the labels at, you want the label at time t to be tied in some way to the label at time t plus one. Because if a word, for example, is part of a population description at index t, it's very likely that the word at index t plus one is as well, right? And so st sort of standard mechanisms for pooling responses from crowd workers or from individual people won't factor this in, but we have this HMM crowd uh, model that, that does. And it, it, it just slaps a Markov chain underneath the David scheme model if you're familiar with that. So, um, what we found is that if you do that and then you sort of use that to train, let's say, an LSTM CRF, you can get pretty good, pretty good performance. Okay, yes? Is it Yeah, good question. So the question is, should, should, maybe we could have just gotten away with sentence level annotation. And like, the answer, Maybe, right? So the thing is, is a lot of times the interventions, for example, are quite short. Like you, maybe you only want like a mention of like aspirin as a really extreme example, right? Um, in other cases, the intervention will be more descriptive and so a bit longer. The population descriptions are, are trickier. Um, part of our motivation for collecting this was we already had the distantly supervised data set with sort of effectively sentence level labels. And so we really wanted to be able to make more granular um, extractions. And maybe this will be better motivated in the next part as well when you want to actually infer like what treatments were studied here and what was found to work. If you're doing that, you really want to be able to label things at like a token level. Um, but yeah, you maybe, maybe we could have gotten away with, um, with doing uh, sentence level label. But uh, the other thing I would say about that is that in the abstract, a lot of the times a given sentence will talk about like, you know, both the intervention and the outcome because the abstract's quite short, right? Um, but yeah, really good question. Cool. Okay, so uh, what, I, what I want to talk about though that relates to this data set is um, sort of difficulty, right? Because we're using crowd workers, like I said, these are lay annotators and we're having them annotate medical text. And so there's this observation here, which is that, you know, crowd annotations are noisy and that's probably especially true on like difficult instances. So um, these things, they might provide more noise than signal. Like if you ask a crowd worker, with no medical background to label a really tricky abstract that's about some really involved thing, like maybe that's, maybe that's sufficiently hard that you're just getting noise, right? Um, I, it, at the same time, we do make some use of actual domain experts, people that with medical training. And so the question is, like, well, I guess the motivation is, ideally we would have the experts annotate the difficult examples and the crowd workers annotate the easier ones, right? Like that would be the ideal, the ideal setup. So, the question then is, can we model and subsequently predict um, the difficulty of instances with respect to annotation 
and use this both to improve the predictive performance of models and also to inform kind of task routing. So you could use this to decide who should label what. Right? And so um, we did some work at NACLA this year, led by Winfei, who's shown here. He's at Google. Um, and basically what we did was we tried to address this question. Right? So um, to do this, we first defined a notion of difficulty. And this we actually define on a sentence level, um, sort of on a sentence level, right? So we basically say, what is the difficulty that we predict for annotating this sentence? And the way that we quantify this is as a scalar. So we don't treat it as like a yes, no. Um, we treat it as a uh, variable on a continuous spectrum. And we say that the difficulty for a task t of instance i uh, is going to be, we'll just say by definition, the average kind of uh, agreement, or sorry, the average disagreement of labels provided by crowd workers indexed by J, so we have N of them here, uh, with some reference label Y sub I for that instance I, right? So F is a scoring function. We used a correlation, basically, which, which counts sort of the correlation between the words that the crowd worker marked versus what an expert marked, or if we don't have expert labels, what a model marked. I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, yeah, right, so just as a, as a reminder, so th this is a, a continuous task, and so it's ultimately a regression task. And the ground truth thing that I just alluded to, what we say is if you have an expert label, like if we happen to have had a doctor annotate that instance i, then that's obviously what we use as the ground truth. When that's not available, we use a trained model as a proxy. And we have some results in the paper that suggest this is a reasonable thing to do. Um, but that's sort of a compromise, right? Because in practice, you, of course, won't have uh, sort of the ground truth, truth annotation for all of your instances, right? So, so yes, yeah, so we use a trained model to do that, OK? Now the task is to predict this, right? So what we want to do is we want to predict the uh, annotation difficulty for a given instance. The, mo the actual model that we use for this isn't terribly interesting. We, um, it's, it's pretty standard. So we take, uh, a, we use a universal sentence encoder combined with um, a neural network uh, encoder. I think we tried both RNN and CNN. It didn't make much of a difference. And basically we just, this guy is pre-trained and we don't, we don't bother updating. Um, and this is learned from scratch. And we just concatenate their representations that they yield and we pass them forward through uh, some layers and, and make a, a prediction. Right. So the question is, does this, does this sort of work? So we're able to predict difficulty pretty well. That's one thing we find in the paper. Um, I think perhaps one of the more interesting findings, at least in my view, was that so once you have this thing, this model, you can take your training data and predict difficulty. You can sort of do a cross-fold thing and predict difficulty for like, you know, one fold at a time. And in that way, you get difficulty scores for all of the instances that are in your training data, right, that are predicted. And what we found is that if you start dropping training data, so on the x-axis here, it's the amount of training data dropped, the percent of training data dropped. On the y-axis, we're, we're showing F1 score. This is for all three of the P, I, and O tagging tasks shown as separate colors. And what we find is that if you drop these in order of difficulty, which is the solid line, you actually get a small boost in performance, right? Not a big one, but you get, a sm you get like a modest boost in predictive performance by removing training data, right? And that's because you're removing the difficult instances. Um, the other lines correspond, for example, to you know, dropping things at random, in which case you see the decline that you would expect to see because you're discarding training data, and that's usually not a great idea. Um, and you know, if, you, if you discard an order of agreement, disagreement, um, you, you, you also see a decline, uh, or at least a much more sort of, you, you, it's more modest, right? But you still don't do better, right? So I guess what, what's sort of interesting about this is like, you can use this as an approach to identify examples in your data set that might be kind of just noise. Right? And that, that's kind of what this suggests, I think. You can also use this as a reweighting scheme. So what you can do is, during training, you can weight the examples that are sort of not difficult. In other words, weight them uh, inversely to the predicted difficulty. And this also 
ends up yielding improvements, right? So you get a couple of points in F-score for the respective elements. So this is kind of cool because this doesn't require any extra training data. It's just kind of introspecting on your data and saying, well, I think this is a really difficult instance, so downweight the um, penalty for getting this wrong, basically. Okay. Um, in terms of task routing, so this is just like using difficulty scores to improve models. In terms of task routing, we did a whole bunch of simulations and actually collected some more data. And what we find is that you know, by being clever about how you route the instances, for example, by routing predicted to be difficult instances to experts and easier ones to crowd workers, you can get about two points in F1 on average. We have a bunch of results in the paper, but you, know, you get a couple of points basically, which, which is nice to see at the same sort of amount of cost. Um, in practice, of course, the particular kind of strategy that you might want to use will depend on the cost of your annotators and the task at hand, right? So these are all factors that, that would come into play. Okay, so th that's what I want to say about Pico elements. Um, the, the bit of work that uh, I'm sort of really excited about now is going further, going sort of beyond just extracting things from trial reports and actually trying to infer what's reported to work, right? Um, so we had this paper also at NACL this year um, that was led by uh, Eric Lehman, who's actually an undergraduate, he's fantastic, and um, Jay DeYoung, who's a PhD student. And this was about basically the task that's shown here, right? So given a full text article describing uh, the conduct and results of a randomized control trial and a prompt which specifies uh, an intervention, a comparator, and an outcome, the task is to infer whether the intervention significantly increased, significantly decreased, or had no significant difference on the outcome as compared to the comparator, right? And one of the things that's interesting about this is that any given full text article that describes an RCT will very likely report results for multiple interventions and multiple outcomes. And so for any given article, we have multiple such prompts. And of course, the answer changes depending on which of these you're interested in. Um, this also has this rationale component where we want the models to also extract the snippet that supports the judgment that um, the model comes to. OK, so that's the task. Um, just to make this a little bit more concrete, um, an annotator, once a prompt is generated, then an annotator that's sort of performing this task would, might be shown you know, the article and then a prompt that says, with respect to headache pain, characterize the reported difference between, let's say, ibuprofen and placebo. Right? And you know, they, they get this multiple choice thing, significantly increased, decreased, or no significant difference. And then they also have to fill out a rationale. Um, the way that we did this, we actually used Upwork, which uh, is a platform where you can hire uh, workers. It's, it's, a, it's maybe less like crowdsourcing and more like um, ad hoc contracting, I guess. And we're able to hire people that have uh, MD credentials on this. Um, so it's a little bit more expensive, but less, less expensive than hiring like doctors in Boston, for example. So what we do is we have one doctor generate prompts, right? And what I mean by this is they read the paper, and they uh, extract uh, instances of interventions, outcomes, and comparators that, for which a result was reported, right? And they, do, they generate like a bunch of these per, per article. Um, so, for example, it might be from this snippet. So, both Advil and Tylenol proved to be significantly more effective for treating headache pain compared to placebo. Right? Um, so, that's kind of one task. And in this case, there would be two prompts that are generated from this, um, this one kind of snippet. And then we had a second independent doctor who received the prompts and completed the, the task. Right? So, they, they got the article, they got the prompt, and they have to say, they have to make the the answer, basically, and provide a rationale, right? And then we had a third uh, independent worker, another doctor, kind of verify the whole process. Um, so that's kind of the workflow. Um, the data looks like this. Uh, I want to mention, so first you can grab the data at evidence-inference.ebm-nlp.com. Um, so ultimately we collected about 10,000 prompts, uh, about 2005, spanning about 2,500 unique articles. Um, one thing I'll mention about this is, we intentionally selected randomized control trial reports from the PubMed open access subset, right? So this is, this is beneficial for multiple reasons. Um, one of them is that you can get it. Uh, and then I guess the other reason is that these are all nice XML files and not terrible PDFs, okay? 
So it's easy to work with. You can kind of browse the data. It looks like this online. OK, so now let's talk about modeling. So how are we going to, to automate this? Um, so the first thing that we did was we spent a lot of time on heuristics because it has this, I had this sense that like, I don't know, like how far can you get by like looking for p-values and stuff um, and doing string matching on the ICOs, the, inter the intervention comparator and outcome prompts that you're given. And so we spent a fair amount of time trying to refine these, but we really didn't get very far. You get about 35 macro averaged F1 um, across the three classes for the downstream task, right? So, so it's not great. Um, logistic regression, just like as stupid as you can get, uh, take a bag of words of the entire article and try to make a prediction, um, gets about 40-ish um, macro average F1. So we had a bunch of pipeline models where you first look at each sentence one at a time and predict, okay, is this a rationale or not for this ICO frame? Um, and those don't do great. You get about 42 um, F1 on average. It didn't really make a difference if you used a, a neural net or a logistic regression in this case. Now, we also sort of experimented with various end-to-end -end baselines, right? So um, the general flavor of these was you take the prompt, the intervention comparator and outcome, and you have encoders that um, sort of you run over those to give you vector representations. And you also encode your article. So one thing I should remind you of is that the article is quite long. It's like 4,000 tokens on average, right? Um, so this is much long, longer than most of the, the inputs that people tend to work with in NLP. And so the encoder, we pass like a GRU, but you could use whatever you like, um, sort of other recurrent variants. And this will give you a bunch of vectors. Um, and then you can impose attention optionally conditioned on the ICO representation over the contextualized token embeddings that are yielded from your encoder. Pass those up together, um, the, the actual sort of embeddings that you get through um, a series of layers to make uh, a prediction regarding the, um, the ultimate finding. Right? So that's kind of the general framework that we um, were working within. OK. Uh, so just a, a few more details on the conditional attention. Um, the way that this works, right, is we have this attention mechanism that's looking at, uh, that, that's looking to score each token, I guess, for relevance, the contextualized representation of that token. And the way that we bake in the intervention, comparator, and outcome under consideration is we just, we take the vectors that were, you know, provided by the ICO encoders, and we just concatenate those to the hidden states from our GRU in this case. But whatever, whatever sort of document encoder you're using, you would take the token vectors and concatenate the ICO representations. And that just gets factored in now to your um, attention scoring sort of procedure or function. OK? Cool. All right. So doing this whole kind of thing and pre-training the attention mechanism, right, because we have the targets, um, you get some gains, but they're pretty modest. So you get up to like 53. Um, I think that was like the best performing model we saw was something like 53 F score. Um, so it's OK. We were still pretty disappointed with this. Like the, the question is sort of, I don't know, like what, why, why is it so hard? So one thing that we played around with a lot was like different ways of pre-training the attention, right? Because again, we have the rationale labels. And we saw earlier with the risk of bias stuff how um, sort of explicitly training with the supervision that you have over rationales can be really helpful. Um, so we tried a whole bunch of different strategies for doing this. Um, but ultimately, no matter what we did, we sort of weren't seeing sort of very big gains. Um, so we wanted to sort of understand if the problem was fundamentally recognizing the relevant um, snippets or if it was doing the inference once those were recognized. So we did this Oracle experiment where we just gave the model the um, relevant prompt directly. And this sort of vastly improves performance, right? So basically, you get into the 70s um, if, you, if you just look at the, uh, the sort of truly relevant snippet. Right. And if you compare this, so this basically says, I'm only focusing on the relevant snippet. right? And if you compare this to what happens when you do the pre-training with the attention, and you look at the attentional mass that's placed over the contextualized representations of the tokens that are part of the marked evidence spans, what you see is that even when you use the pre-training, which are these two bars, 
it's only like 10 to 14% of the attentional mass is placed over those tokens, right? So it's sort of not, not great. Um, and yeah, so this is probably the, the issue. And because these documents are so long, it's really hard for the signal to kind of be carried through. Maybe this is all irrelevant, though, because of course, uh, after we uh, sort of had this paper, uh, you know, BIRD has come to dominate. Um, and in particular, there's this notion of like these bio BIRDs or Dr. BIRDs that have been trained over, you know, PubMed specifically, right? And CyBIRD and things like this. So we've gotten, these are very, very preliminary results. But um, so right now we've been looking at, you know, sort of encoding the interventions, comparators, and outcomes and selecting, basically doing a pipeline model where you um, conditionally score sentences, condition on the um, ICO, the intervention, comparator, and outcome for relevance, and then pass, pass that forward to a model that does the classification, right? And so that, this just looks like this. Basically, you take your sentence, it might, might be X lowered Z significantly, and then somehow you bake that into the um, input that you give to BERT. BERT gives you back a vector, and you say, is this evidence or not? And we train that directly. And then subsequently, we take the best sentence and pass it forward through a different BERT model and make our classification. Right? And this does really well. So um, one, one thing that we wanted to experiment with was when you're training the evidence selector, you have to select like negative examples. right? Because um, you have a handful, I guess, of sentences that are, so are evidence. And then you have to pick your negative examples to train your model. So you can do this in various ways. One way is to just randomly take other sentences. That's not very sharp, though. So we've been experimenting. Again, all of this is quite preliminary, but we've been experimenting with, for example, taking a random positive sentence from another document, which is like evidence for some other article, right? Or evidence from the same document, but for a different ICO frame, and treating that as a negative example. So that's like even sharper, right? And so again, very preliminary results. But, um, but kind of combining these strategies, we're getting, we think, we think, um, in the mid-70s almost for the end-to-end -end task. So um, we, there may still be a bug, um, but, but we're really excited about this direction. So we'll see how this all pans out. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of see. OK, so this is actually the model that I showed at the beginning, right? Uh, this is actually the model that's in Robot Reviewer right now. So we have like a BERT to BERT thing. And what it will do is it will take the, the punch, we call it the punchline, which is like the rationale, and, and then it will tell you the direction of the finding, right? And um, so we're sort of excited about pushing these things out and seeing if they're, I guess, useful in practice. So um, the last thing I want to just talk about is ongoing work and sort of where we're going with all of this. And one of the things that we, we have now is we have like the, all these models that sort of extract various things from clinical trials, and we also sort of have all of the trials, right? So uh, I didn't mention it, but we, we also have like, it's actually surprisingly hard to identify all randomized control trials. Like PubMed has a manual publication type tag that you can use, but that's manually applied, so there's a big lag. Um, so we actually have a model that I didn't talk about that recognizes these. So we've indexed all of them, we have them all. And we have all this structured data that we extract. And so we've been thinking about like, what, what can we do with this? So one thing that we've been looking at is sort of alternative browsing interfaces for the medical literature. So um, here, for example, you know, you might search for migraine. And the idea is that using our models that I've just described, this thing can automatically generate like an evidence map for you. What this means is, you know, say, you, say you're diagnosed with a new condition, right? You don't know anything about it. You're like, oh, I have migraines. Um, how do you know like what treatment options you have and, are, and what works? And so what we've been playing with are sort of Interfaces like this, where the y-axis are different interventions that we've extracted automatically, right, from all the clinical trials, and the x-axis shows the different outcomes that we've extracted for those interventions, and each dot is a trial, and the color, so the size, the size of the trial that we extract is reflected in the size of the bubble, and the efficacy that's inferred is from our model that does the inference, right? So what this is saying, right, is like it thinks that, I don't know, um, <laughs> well, placebo is like always effective, which is just the depressing reality, I guess. But uh, <laughs> if you look at, at like this drug here, it seems to be pretty effective for, I guess, um, treating migraine disorders. So there's a lot of work to be done on like, um, 
what the right way of reporting and sort of clustering the outcomes we find are, but we're excited about this as a direction. Um, the, last, the very last thing I'll talk about is a different kind of use of this data, which is actually analyzing disparities that's in the, that are in the evidence base. Right? And in particular, as I mentioned, so we have this kind of pipeline now where we, we monitor PubMed, we've got this RCT classifier, we find the RCTs, we do this PICO tagging, we do some term normalization that I didn't talk about, but we can like normalize to a meta, the UMLS, which is a, like a standardized vocabulary for medical stuff. And in this way, we can make comparisons to other things. And in particular, um, one of the things that we've been looking at are the diseases that, have, that are included in the global burden of diseases analysis. So again, this is all preliminary, but um, this is showing the conditions that are assessed in that global burden of diseases study. And what people are trying to do there is assess like what are the conditions that are responsible for the most kind of suffering basically in the world. Um, and here we're showing of the, of the diseases that were considered, the disease categories, I guess, that were considered in that analysis, like how, how has the evidence kind of emerged over time, relatively speaking? So the y-axis here, this is really just a proportion of randomized control trials that were published, and this is automatically inferred, right? So we, we look at all the RCTs, and we look for RCTs that were tagged with um, standardized vocabulary terms that correspond to these disease categories. And so that's what this is showing. Um, so you can actually zoom into this by contrasting, for example, the DALIs, which is the uh, disability adjusted life years, which is the measure used by the global burden of diseases study. And you can see like sort of the contrast between how much burden is imposed globally for a given condition, which is the, the black bar, versus how much evidence is out there that, that's been done for these, right? And so what you can see is that, you know, in a lot of cases, for example, for things like respiratory infections and tuberculosis, um, what you can see is that there's relatively little evidence given how much um, of a burden that these conditions impose, right? So these things were kind of known, but like we weren't able to do these kinds of analysis before at scale. So we did a, we can actually scatter this. So if you scatter the disability adjusted life years, which is the measure of suffering, versus the number of uh, published RCTs that we identify for these conditions, again, using those PICO tagging models, um, what you can see is that there is a obvious, there, as, as you would hope, there is a correlation, right? So the more burden something imposes, the more evidence there tends to be for it. However, um, if you look now at the amount of evidence, number of published RCTs, um, versus a ratio of the burden that these conditions impose in higher socioeconomic standing countries versus lower, what you can see is a negative correlation, which says that um, diseases, there's more than expected evidence, it seems, for the disease categories that tend to disproportionately affect uh, higher income countries, right, is, is what, you, what you would infer from this. So these are kind of ongoing analyses, but uh, we're, super, we're super excited to kind of keep looking at, at this. Uh, and with that, I think uh, I'll, I'll wrap up. And again, shout out to the students that do the hard work. Um, and uh, I'll take any questions if we have time. Thanks. Oh. So whoever wants to leave can leave, but uh, whoever wants to stay and ask questions can push up and we'd just like to thank Byron for coming here. Thanks for having me. <laughs>